Welcome, one and all. My name is Yuri, and great that you are back for this third edition of Artisan Conversation by Dutch Culture, a series that is all about artistic dialogue, international relations, and shared experiences. Today, we'll explore the shared and uh, cultural and political predicament between the Netherlands and Hungary. We've got two conversations lined up for you. The first one between Hainaka Shomugi and Sofia Hernandez Chonkui. The second between Andras Torok and Linda Malherbe. Furthermore, our guests from Hungary um, have invited young Hungarian talents to share the stage today. So we will also welcome Dominika Trapp and Daniel Salai, who will present their work for us today. But first, we'll go to Josef May. Hi, welcome. Great to have you. Where do we uh, find you today? Um, I'm at home in St. Andrea. Ah, great. Uh, 20 kilometers from Budapest. Oh, great. So um, for all of you watching, Jozef is an art historian, art critic and curator. And he's also assistant professor at the Department of Art Theory at the Hungarian University of the Arts. His field of research is 20th century contemporary art and primarily art in public space. Uh, Joseph, as I understand, you've written something for us today, which, right? Which you would like to recite. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. How has our culture in Hungary changed? Uh, the question is difficult to answer briefly. Nevertheless, it is possible to sum it up in a single sentence. The EU flag has not been raised above the parliament building for years. Perhaps the cultural change is actually best measured in terms of the flags and the displacement of, dis displacement of colors. As a result of a political decision, the huge football stadium built on the location of the former, which is lit up in national colors each evening, may be filled to capacity in the time of COVID. All around it, almost like wallpaper, there are national flags everywhere with the names of towns and villages from both within and beyond the borders of Hungary on them. The stadium is full of large groups of people in black t-shirts, shaking their fists and shouting. They have scarves around their necks printed with the contour of the country, as it was before the First World War, filled with red, white and green. They even shouted uh, while marching on the streets on the way to the stadium, a few only becoming quiet while they popped into one of the tobacco shops on the way, which have been mandatorily design, designated national for years. The stores are marked everywhere with the same logo, designed to resemble a target, the outer circle being brown and red, white, green within. Marching through the still largely empty town, the men in black pass in front of many of old buildings, almost all, all of which still have the old double flag holders on them, used for the Hungarian and the red communist flags the caretakers had to put up on national holidays 40, 50 years ago. These iron flag holders are being replaced only slowly, and today in many places in Budapest, two Hungarian flags are put up next to each other. This black army also filled, filed past the Kunsthalle, where the old trees of the city park are being cut down or moved to make way for the huge buildings of the new museum quarter. Two flags in the national colors hang either side in front of the Kunsthalle building, which ceased to be the center of contemporary art some 10 years ago. In 2013, as an act of protest, an artist replaced one of them for the EU flag. No one paid any notice and it hung there for six months until it became worn and someone replaced it again for the red, white and green. The fans in black also visited the bank of the Danube where there is an enormous Hungarian flag on a towering flagpole. I always look at it in the mornings on the way to work the wind often twists it up, and if the wind isn't blowing, it just hangs there sadly. It makes me think that in the past, our flag culture must have been different. I imagine there were experts who knew 
how large the flag should be on a given size of flagpole so the flag flies properly. I suppose these old experts are working elsewhere now. Maybe they are looking after someone else's flags in other countries. As for those who stayed behind, well, they, they follow the political instructions. The flagpole should be as tall as possible and the flag as large as possible. Maybe at the beginning, they quietly contradicted. Excuse me, but it won't fly properly like that. But then they saw, they too saw there was no point in disagreeing because counter arguments in illiberal systems are only seen as the complaints of intellectuals. In the meantime, the intellectuals of Budapest have themselves marched up to the parliament, which rainbow as well, with rainbow as well as Hungarian and EU flags to protest against the government's new homophobic leg legislation. Many of them with a symbol in their pockets, the yellow mask made for the last large demonstrations, demonstration taking place in the short break from the pandemic. The mask demanded the return of the freedom of the University of Theater and Film Arts and has a drawing of a yellow hand on a black background on it. It is a fact. We are living in colors and symbols. Centuries in the future when those living then glance back to this age, maybe this will seem to be the most characteristic of us. Every month we change the colors of protest or on our Facebook profiles or according to the evidence of photographs of public spaces, we had an almost magical belief in the power of colors, flags and insignias. Then it will be more apparent how much more we were attached to the far past than the future. And that as far as our beliefs are concerned, we were not much different to the people living in this region during the Middle Ages. Author Peter Nadosh, who when asked about the change, said in an interview not long ago that throughout the world we are in a regressive and mannerist age of culture, as opposed to the previous progressive and creative wave. He is very probably right, and this is especially apparent in the case of Hungary. Thank you, Josef. What a touching text. Uh, I think it gives a strong context to the conversations that are to follow today. Now, uh, seeing, seeing, this, uh, seeing this history and this moment that you describe of recognition with history, if you look forward, what would you say is the potential, the strength now of the Hungarian art scene at the moment? Um, if I had to answer with one word, uh, our strength now is uh, weakness because after more than uh, 10 years of illiberal regime uh, there is hardly anything left in the institutional framework of contemporary art that can be destroyed uh, or what still can be destroyed was so weak that anyway that it is not a shame if it is uh, destroyed so uh, it is, it is a bad thing, uh, this weakness, but uh, because, uh, because uh, I, I'm very sad about uh, that creativity and talent that I see every day in the works and ideas of art students at the academy uh, cannot develop later or it can develop only uh, other countries. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are another problem, problems with this weekend, the weakness uh, um, that um, without this uh, appropriate institutions, the, the energies cannot be concentrated. But uh, we can quickly switch between strength and weakness. So if you ask about the strengths of the Hungarian art scene, uh, I can answer also with another word, uh, flexibility. Hmm. Yeah. Well, flexibility is often requested, but I really like your perspective of saying or uh, questioning, like, how can we turn this weakness that is the result of a terrible history into our strength? I think that's a, a brave point of departure. Uh, let's hope um, uh, let's hope the scene gets uh, that opportunity. Thank you for, uh, for joining us. Thank you. We're going to go to our next conversation. Um, and this will be in a conversation between Hainaka Shomoji and Sofia Hernandez-Jonkui. 
Hainaka is the founder and leader of the OFF Biennale Budapest. It's the largest independent art event of Central Europe. And the OFF Biennale was invited to co-organize the next documenta in Kassel. Before OFF, Hainaka worked as a curator at the Ludwig Museum of Contemporary Art and led the Trafo House in Budapest. Sophia has an art curator, occasional writer and constant traveler. Uh, and besides that, she is director of the Kunstinstitut Melli in Rotterdam since 2018. Before heading to Rotterdam, Sophia has been working as a curator all over the world. Sophia Hainaka, welcome. And uh, the next 20 minutes are all yours. Thank you, Yuri. Um, so I guess this is the time when, I, when I'm to show the image I chose for this conversation. Um, <laughs> okay, so what you can see here is a really large panel uh, painted on fiberboard. Um, the date is 1983 and the author is Tamás Péli, who was a Hungarian painter of Roma origin, was that he had this very strong mission that he wants to be the founder of contemporary Roma Hungarian art and to kind of introduce it into the international uh, art world as well. So, and when he came back to Hungary, he found himself in the midst of the just forming uh, Roma intelligentsia, a small circle of uh, intellectuals, writers, educators, uh, musicians, uh, composers, artists, and so on and so forth. Then uh, it became uh, this really um, important programmatic work to articulate in visual terms the founding myth, like the ethnogenesis of the, of the Roma people, but also to articulate how um, the Hungarian nation and Hungarian history uh, is intertwined with, with the Roma presence, how one couldn't exist without the other. And so um, what you can see basically in the uh, upper middle part is uh, the goddess Kali, who is a very important figure in Roma ethnogenesis. And at that time, it wasn't only Paley, but basically the international Roma civil rights movement who kind of uh, dealt with the, with the story of Kali. And she's uh, holding the first Roma, Manush, up to the to the god who is sitting on this horse this uh, naked figure but it's also programmatic work in another sense uh, as i said uh, it depicts various uh, points in hungarian roma history uh, through symbolic figures um, like national uprisings also the holocaust in the lower middle part um, uh, and uh, some arts and crafts and trades that are associated with the roma uh, here in hungary and the third layer of the image is actually pointing towards the future because uh, the faces of these symbolic figures are um, portraits of his friends and, and, uh, and colleagues, uh, other Roma artists and intellectuals, so you can actually identify them. And also the process of the painting was very collaborative as uh, all these friends were kind of traveled there and they were around while, Pe while Paley was working on this image. And uh, as they very often kind of spent time together and, and, um, and discussed stuff together, they really inspired each other's work, which you can feel and see if you read um, uh, Menjet Lakatos's writings, um, Josef Cholidaroti's writings, um, these are all kind of interrelated to this program that was that was kind of uh, articulated in this picture. So uh, the story of it is kind of typical to to the situation of Roma in this part of the world. Um, it was up there, and it was really important also for children whose oh the title is birth. Sorry, that's the title birth. So it was especially important in a place where, you know, kids didn't really have a connection with their own birth. They didn't know their parents. They didn't have, you know, they didn't have a strong kind of family identity. So for them, having this image there, uh, this programmatic image of, of Roma and Hungarian Roma identity um, had a very, very strong importance, with, which we know firsthand by those people who, who, 
who grew up there and today are important members of the Roma community. Um, so there are first-hand accounts of this importance. Um, uh, so uh, it was up there uh, uh, until 2010. The children's Repub uh, the children's uh, city it was called. So the children's home was um, dismantled. The building was privatized. It's a castle. It's a beautiful castle. So of course it was privatized. Um, and in 2011, a hotel was uh, established in the building. So then uh, the panel was dismantled into four pieces. It is of four pieces and was put into the uh, corridor of a countryside museum, like the closest countryside museum. So it was safe, but completely invisible for 10 years. And so in the frame of Of Biennale, um, uh, together with the uh, Budapest History Museum, um, we had this project uh, to, to bring it out uh, of the storage and to make it visible for the first time in a public institution and a very mainstream kind of national public institution that is in the Royal Castle in Budapest. Um, so the opening was on the 8th of June, uh, very recently. And it's not only about showing the image, as, as you can see, you know, there are lots of things to talk about it. Not all of them are without problems, right? Uh, for example, the depiction of women, or I can, probably mention other aspects that are worth discussing from a contemporary point of view. So it's not only an exhibition of the painting, but also a series of discussions and other discursive programs that try to uh, interpret and reinterpret this very important work and uh, find its place um, in a discursive way. But also, I think, uh, another critical um, stake of the project is to find the final place for this work. So the question is where it's going to go after the show uh, that ends in September. So that was my selection. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, uh, I think that uh, they have to put also my image so that we discuss. But I have a lot of questions for you that maybe we could address immediately after. Um, I uh, put a personal photograph. Uh, with a little camera that uh, at that point, uh, this image is from 2008. Uh, and at that point, I did not have a, a smartphone with a camera. I don't even know if they existed at that time, to say the truth. But this image is uh, taken in China in Dongsheng, and it presents uh, Him and Chong, the artist uh, based in Singapore, and he is standing on left. And on right is me. Uh, uh, again, this is 2008, uh, and we are both uh, in China, and uh, it's an important photograph, not because of the aesthetic quality, uh, it's a vacation, so to say, uh, image, but it's an important photograph because of what, what it represents uh, in terms of my uh, professional life, my uh, personal life, and how they come to meet. Kim and Chong uh, was in the early 2000s based in Berlin, as many artists, uh, and in fact, as Thomas Pelli himself, uh, artists traveled abroad, not only to be trained in a formal uh, academic setting uh, of fine arts, but also in, in seeking artistic communities who shared affinities. Uh, we can call these intellectual affinities. Him and Chong uh, had moved from Singapore to Berlin and was running a, an art space uh, together with Lisa Nelman at that time in Berlin, the space was called Sparse Wasser. And in the photograph that we're looking at of 2008, uh, meaning some years after I had met already him and Chong, uh, it happened uh, as I was in search of my own family roots in China, uh, where my grandfather had come from before migrating to Mexico. And uh, I went there as the first member of my family, being a third generation, Chinese Mexican, uh, I went there to search for his home and to understand his roots. And him and Chong, uh, who at that time was back in Singapore, chose to accompany me and serve as my interpreter during the trip. He knew Mandarin, and even though we were going to China in a region where they spoke Cantonese, he said that he could wing it, and he did. And uh, from basically having a professional relationship for many years in which uh, art projects, exhibitions and such had developed, 
suddenly there was a turn, which happens in many of uh, the artistic communities that I've come to study or to work in, that uh, your intellectual affinities become part of your uh, uh, sensible uh, and effective experiences in life. So Heman accompanied me as an interpreter, translator, so to say, to search for my roots uh, in the small village that had been pretty much uh, collapsed as well uh, after the years of Mao and hence why many people have immigrated. The largest city around there is uh, Guangzhou and between Dongsheng and Guangzhou is a, a city called Kaiping, which is, we're talking here about uh, from the Southern zone of China and which is an area where most of the Chinese immigrants abroad, including the ones in, a, in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and also in many parts of the world, such as in Mexico and in the United States, this is the area in which most uh, Chinese people come from before they leave to emigrate. The cities are, a, you know, a abandoned almost. A, we are standing in the second gate of the city here. They are, a, there's about three to a, five families that live there now. And a, and I, a, yeah, I, I got to learn a lot about the affinities, not just within my own family roots, but also, for example, something that in Latin America is called a, the architecture of hope. The architecture of hope are all of these homes that are in the process of being constructed, but they, they are forever in the process of being constructed. And that the majority of the funds for their construction come from a, what's called remesas, which is the money that a, the families that have emigrated send back to their original countries and their families. In the city of Kaiping, which is near, near Dongsheng, this village, a, you find not only this architecture of hope, but also a very similar architectural style. And a, I, a, yeah, I am fascinated by the way in which a, the migration of form in terms of, for example, architecture, but also here in, in the Netherlands in terms of blue and white ceramics, which we call blue Delft or Delft Blau, how they come to represent the movement of people. I think that uh, for me, it's much more interesting right now to turn the conversation to you, Hajnalga, to talk about the history of the Roma people in Hungary and to be able to learn about this through the painting of uh, Thomas Telly, whose attendance at the Royal Academy is a uh, news to me. It's uh, one of my favorite schools, uh, art schools, I would say, in the entire planet Earth, uh, regardless of the fact that it's going to some uh, troubles that I would say are part of the challenges that are presented in a period uh, characterized by decolonization as it is here in the Netherlands, in which institutions or so-called established histories are being questioned and in which uh, the people that have gen been generally considered or the ideas that have been generally uh, emerged in minority groups are suddenly taking uh, a bigger stage. So this, I think, is a good way to turn back to the work of Thomas Pelli and uh, to understand a little bit about uh, what, you, uh, what you're saying to us is a relationship be in between the history of, of Hungary being unable to be told without speaking of Roma's history. Exactly, like that, that, was, that was his vision. Uh, actually, it was also kind of a mixed origin because uh, his mother was a Roma woman and uh, his father was a you know, white Hungarian, non-Roma, uh, uh, guy, uh, but he strongly identified with his Roma roots. Um, anyways, um, mm -hmm. but I think what is important at this point and what really kind of might connect uh, our activities in the past uh, few years is that uh, this project uh, showing uh, Paley's monumental painting in uh, the royal castle in Hungary is part of a larger um, project that is an international uh, collaboration or more like trans, trans national, translocal collaboration mm -hmm. um, that Oviennale um, initiated together with the European Roma Institute for Arts and Culture. And this institute is also really interesting. It's relatively new. It was founded in um, 2017. And um, the, the director uh, of this institution is Timo Junkhaus, a Hungarian art historian of Roma origin. 
who has been at the forefront for um, of like fighting for Roma self representation in art and culture, for you know institutions of uh, that would enable Roma self representation and access to to uh, heritage and uh, you know means of production. Um, so that that that's like a, a long long marching for Timea uh, that had various steps. And in the mid 2000s, she came up with this um, very tactical kind of gesture of um, of creating the idea of Roma Moma, which is a playful name, you know, uh, kind of subverting the idea of the of the major kind of modern and contemporary art museum. And she used it as a logo only uh, when she curated the first Roma pavilion in Venice, which was again a milestone in uh, in this uh, in this history of uh, of the acknowledgement of Roma contemporary art. Um, mm -hmm. Among the supporters, among the partners, she put this ro uh, this logo of Roma MoMA, which is obviously a non-existing thing. And um, well, obviously, this is, this wasn't a new idea. The idea of a Roma museum, either on a national scale or an, or an international scale, has been around since the 70s, since the, the Roma civil rights and cultural movement. Uh, but Timio has been certainly one of the one of the fighters uh, uh, in this in this long uh, long story. And uh, you know, truth to be told, until today, there is no Roma contemporary art museum or even Roma modern art museum uh, of a transnational scale. In Hungary, we don't have like any kind of uh, art institution uh, for the Roma. The situation has been deteriorated uh, in the past 10 years, even those small civil uh, initiatives like the Roma Parliament, the Roma Press Center, um, uh, the Amarodrom uh, Journal has, has been either uh, um, kind of ceased to exist or have become, you know, really just weak and without resources. Um, so in this situation, the idea of the of the Roma Museum came up again. And um, since 2019, we've been in discussion and have been organizing uh, uh, events uh, and, uh, and programs around it. So the Roma MoMA idea is basically the idea of a transnational uh, Museum of Roma Contemporary Art, and and um, it is to raise questions uh, in the first place. It's a discursive artistic project that poses the question whether we need such an institution, and if so, what should it be? So it's not only interesting in in the, in the sense of like minority representation, but also in the debate about the current debate about museums and what a museum should be, and obviously it ties into really you know acutely into the current discourses around decolonization. Mm -hmm. And this kind of um, legitimacy crisis of of mainstream uh, museums. Uh, yeah. So I think it's a really, really uh, exciting um, uh, idea and series of questions that come together uh, um, under this umbrella of of, uh, of, a, of a potential uh, Roma museum. Yeah. I think that one and, of the things. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Just I mean, to say. I mean, I think that one of the things that uh, the question that you raise is uh, whether you know, whether it should be a museum or how, it, what is the validity of it? I think that it is a question of our times, not only because of the of the process of uh, decolonization that are going throughout uh, the world in different scales at different levels, but specifically as it pertains to um, how, like what does it mean to collect uh, nowadays? Uh, are all cultures, uh, are all traditions uh, ones to keep the object for posterity, or is it part of the spiritual nature or the belief system of other communities in which a, a collection would not necessarily be the best modality to keep heritage alive? So I would say that in, in terms of the, I know that it's, it's an art, but I think that what is to question there is not only the role of the museum as an institution, but specifically, the role of modernity as a philosophical or time period. Is it that we're talking about a modern art as it is implied with MoMA? A, and what is the place of modernity for the Roma people or in general for our understanding of, of art? It is in fact a, the terminology of the modern or the contemporary that is at critique a, at present because a, the focus of the trans-historical is what's, a, what's being addressed primarily so that we understand other forms of making history, other kinds of collection that are not object oriented, and uh, yeah, other forms of 
dealing with uh, communities and movements that are not just associated with immigration. And I would say that the Roma people are, are specific to that. It is not just about immigration, which is the topic of our times, but it is also about the uh, movement of people as part of the very indigenous nature that, uh, that they proclaim. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, this is what I love about this project, that I, I, I tell people the basics and then they answer with like yeah, 50 questions uh, right away and they are all very relevant. Um, so exactly, yeah, these, these are the things that, that, um, that we are speaking about. There is a blog also um, um, by Eriak uh, that has uh, lots of uh, contributions already. Uh, Roma and non-Roma uh, kind of contributing to the conversation and telling their ideas. And um, yeah, and then this is this is just uh, about to, to to grow into something transnational that we will be occupied with in the in the upcoming years. Um, so yeah, well, I feel that we've just started, uh, so we will definitely, I think, find some time to to continue this conversation, or at least I hope so. Um, I, I, I'm also really interested in, in, in your experiences with all these questions uh, in the past years. Um, so thank you uh, for, for starting this and I hope we will continue. Hajnalka, it's great uh, to have uh, so many years of conversation with you and it seems that we're at a new stage uh, in our work uh, ahead for culture. Great, thank you both very much. Uh, for this conversation. Um, we're going to go to the next chapter. And for that, uh, Hainaka, we invited you to introduce an emerging, emerging artist whose practice you feel uh, our viewers should see. Uh, and you chose Dominica Trapp, a visual artist who is currently studying at the uh, Multimedia Doctoral Program uh, at the University of Applied Arts in Budapest. Uh, could you shortly tell us why you feel uh, we should see Dominica today? Um, I think that she is one of those young people who have a very acute sense and a really kind of uh, complex understanding of our culture and political predicament. And uh, she can really touch upon some nerves uh, that, um, that many of, of us feel should be touched upon uh, from, a, from, a, from a kind of elaborated feminist viewpoint. You know, the ideas of like how tradition is hijacked in current political discourses and how we can kind of reclaim it and uh, instead of, you know, keeping it in schkons and how, how we can kind of use it in our uh, way forward. She's been uh, dealing with, with many really interesting uh, topics from uh, folk culture uh, to other kind of traditions. So it's a wide ranging interest, but it's kind of held together. Uh, by her understanding of, of our past and our and our and our present, and uh, finally, because even though the 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 project that she's been dealing with in the past years uh, are very relevant here in Hungary, I think it's well worth to see beyond the uh, the borders. Obviously, it's it's very relevant also uh, internationally. And finally, finally, because she's also a young person who 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 kind of understands how to operate. Uh, among these less than ideal circumstances. She's super proactive. She, co she has collaborated with so many various people and she can really bring together various knowledges and sensitivities. And I, and I really appreciate that. That's a very um, generous introduction. So let's uh, go to um, Dominica. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, well, what would you like to share with us today? Uh, I would like to share uh, the works of the recent years and uh, I will read my text out loud to fit the time frame if it's not a problem for you. Feel free to take the floor. Thank you. So from the very beginning of my career, my practice has been characterized by a two-way interest. On the one hand, a sensitive painterly approach that allows for intuition and introspection. And on the other hand, an outward directed sensitivity aiming to facilitate dialogues between communities in the service of collective self-knowledge. 
The reason of the latter is rooted in my own mobility history, but its topicality is given by the division that forces Hungarian society into cultural trenches. Reflection on this division and the attempt to eliminate it manifested in the Peasants in Atmosphere project in the most explicit way. This collaborative piece can be considered as the starting point of my artistic research that has been ongoing ever since. Between 2017 and 2019, I conducted immersive fieldwork in the innermost circles of the Hungarian folk revival scene. In the 70s, the so-called dance house movement emerged in the context of a number of youth movements against the manufactured programs of socialist planning. Their search for authentic folk forms had led them to ethnographers who encouraged them to organize events based on the Transylvanian dance house. Their activity was regarded by the state as a suspicious practice. Now the dance house method is protected by the UNESCO and is a cultural phenomenon highly valued by the nationalist Hungarian government. My research focused primarily on contemporary artistic interpretations of peasant culture and the different ways the new generation of folk artists relates to the countercultural heritage of the movement. In the present, I face the lack of interpretations related to contemporary art discourse and emerging ethnographic trends seem to not affect the artistic practice of the members of the movement. In light of all of this, I decided to develop a research-based project series that seeks to rely on current ethnographic and theoretical tendencies to create artistic interpretations in active dialogue with the present. My first attempt was Peasants in Atmosphere, a stage musical production accompanied by a publication. As I contacted young dance house musicians, mostly children of the founders of the movement, and members of the experimental music scene to join and cooperate, I endeavored to critically interpret the musical heritage of the Hungarian peasantry. During my research, I examined peasant culture from the viewpoint of contemporary discourses around the crisis of human nature relations. After our premiere at Off Biennale Budapest in 2017, the band received invitations from across the country and our activity generated subversive discussions in the contemporary art field and the folk revivalist scene. In my subsequent collaborative solo show called Don't Lay Him On Me, I focused on the narrow segment of Hungarian ethnography that dealt with women's autobiographies. Because of their brutal honesty, these confessional texts stand out from traditional folk narratives, which are generally aligned with the conventional conception of the community. Relying in part on these sources, I examine the room for maneuver provided by tradition in relation to the past, present and future. The exhibition highlighted radical detours of folk traditions and examples of consensually accepted norms on different bodies, the body of the peasant woman, the body of the female folk dancer, and the body perceived as a fetish object. I think my efforts contribute to the contemporary interpretations of peasant culture and the enrichment of artistic research as an emergent methodology. The inherent interdisciplinarity of the creative attitude promotes the possibility of collaboration and strengthens the ability to re resilience both of which, faced with the challenges posed by the manifold crisis of our present, seem valuable tools in the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, insightful presentation and uh, super interesting work. Now, it strikes me that you um, are really investigating the boundary between uh, this idea of tangible and intangible heritage, and then specifically also somehow the way that narratives and stories travel which is something that's of all, also of interest to us for our show. So could you care to elaborate a bit on that, uh, specifically the stories that you found and the way they were used to convey narratives? Uh, you mean the stories of the peasant women that I mentioned? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's, uh, I worked with an, with an anthology of these autobiographies and uh, uh, it raised my interest because I rarely see uh, feminist uh, uh, focus in, uh, in uh, artworks related to peasant culture. So I thought that there is a hiatus here that I should fill in 
with my work. So this was my initial motivation, partly. Mm -hmm. So these are texts that are rarely uh, cited in the context of, uh, of uh, contemporary interpretations of peasant culture. Mm -hmm. So, so then they were not texts that were in any way used to uh, have narratives travel until you picked them up again. Uh, no, no. Uh, they were. These are texts from the the eighties and seventies, and it's a it's it's a it's a rare book. Mm -hmm. So this was my motivation to to put it in a new context or refresh. Uh, the narrative or co connected to contemporary issues. And what has the feedback so far been uh, in uh, in Hungary to these narratives? Were people surprised that you were took this as specifically as an interest or? Yeah, there was a, a small backlash, I would say. So um, I got some pretty negative uh, feedbacks from the right wing media outlets. But uh, for me, it wasn't a pleasant experience because I thought that, okay, now I'm in a trap of these cultural wars that I wanted to somehow exceed or to mm -hmm. create works that are, that are, that the, lo that the logics of is not uh, uh, divided by this, this dichotomic uh, um, culture war. Uh, mm -hmm ideology so yeah still you were framed as such yes yeah. yes yes partly because of this uh, the feminist narrative is a is a is a <laughs> is not a very popular uh, a way of thinking amongst the right-wing intellectuals yeah. Yeah. although i worked with the existing uh, ethnographic materials with the with the with a female focus, so. Well, brave, and thank you for uh, for joining your, uh, for sharing your story today with us, uh, Dominica. Thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure, thank you. Um, I now would like to invite uh, Andreas Torok and Linda Malherbe to join us for our next conversation. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Great. Very well. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Sandras is a cultural manager and author from Budapest. He served as the Deputy Minister of Culture and as President of the Hungarian National Cultural Fund uh, in the 90s. He was a board member of the European Cultural Foundation and today he joins us as the manager of Fortepan, a community-based photography archive. Welcome. And Linda? Uh, joins us from Rotterdam, right, Linda? Yes. yes. Hi. Uh, Linda is the initiator and curator of Verhalenhuis Belvedere, that is Story House Belvedere, the first house for intangible culture and uh, heritage in the Netherlands. Uh, Verhalenhuis sets out to connect as many people as possible with each other uh, and with the city through art, culture, and especially personal stories. Uh, they make people, communities, and the changing city visible to a wide audience and hope to contribute with this project to uh, social development in the city. Yes. Um, I'm going to give the floor to you both. Uh, enjoy your conversation. Um, and um, the floor is all yours. Hi, Andres. <laughs> hi, hi, hi. So here is my Oh, yes. <laughs> so I submitted. I was asked to share a photo with mm -hmm. you, and mm -hmm. um, I chose this one. This is a photo from 1952. Okay. Uh, you you may not be familiar with Hungarian history, but this was the deepest of the deep communist dictatorship. Mm -hmm. uh, people were practically starving. Uh, there was a shortage of everything. And that family in the Buddha Hills are just enjoying life. Yeah. Um, this is this is uh, um, um, from a donation from a lady called Jenji. We don't remember who she was, and uh, and then uh, we use this photo to illustrate an interview of the founder and editor in the women's 
weekly of the biggest circulation. And uh, the little girl here is now almost 80 now, and she happens to be the subscriber to the weekly. And uh, she, she was shocked to see herself, not so much herself, but her mother, father, and aunt. Uh, they, they, they are long gone, and uh, uh, she didn't have this photo at all. So we liked that photo so much, but two years later, we, we, we were lucky to organize a huge exhibition in the National Gallery Budapest, uh, mm -hmm. a 1,500 square meter exhibition, and we chose this as the, as the title and the poster, we put it on the poster, and there is a huge uh, catalog, and it's on, 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 on the corner of the catalog. And uh, this is, this symbolizes our effort to reconstruct the past, because uh, there were people who lived in the past, even in the darkest communist dictatorship, in, in the framework of the darkest communist dictatorship, people tried to live their life and try to enjoy their life. We don't know who these people were, must have been civil servants far away from the political life. So at the moment we have over uh, 150,000 freely downloadable photos, you can download it in large resolution, even that one you can use, use for, for anything. And uh, this is uh, typical of a treasure. It was thrown out possibly by a family, that's how an other lady picked it up and donated it to Fortapan. So we try to reconstruct the past, reconstruct Hungarian past, but uh, our uh, um, appetite is ever growing in the 11 years of our existence. We have some 280 photographs from the Netherlands, for example. Mm -hmm. but from all over the world. But originally, but basically, we want to reconstruct Hungarian past and we only collect photos uh, until 1990, because our founder thinks mm -hmm. that the past starts in 1990. Well, Anders, can I have uh, one question for you? Yes, of because, course. Uh, I'm from stories, storytelling, so uh, on, the, uh, on your archives, on your website, do you also tell the story behind this photo? No, no. It's a very streamlined project because we don't have the energy. We are just processing millions of photos and pick the meaningful photos. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put tags or, so to speak, it's not us, but the users put tags on the photos. So others can uh, use it for anything. We don't collect stories. We, we no. collect photographs and we share photographs. It's a 24, mm -hmm. 24th hour project because uh, thousands of film negatives are thrown out even this month. So we want to save. This is a last minute project. And, uh, and uh, we, we, were, we were advised to, to add stories, but we don't have the energy. We have only one paid staff member, the editor, and all the others are volunteers. And we are happy if we can put together technically this, uh, this portal and we can share it with others and add 2,000, about 2,000 photos every month. And, and, and do, we you have... accept, do you accept all photos? Uh, which are donated, or do you make a selection? Or? Oh yes, yes, yes. It's a the, the editor is a curator, so uh, we have given. We, you can't upload photos on this website. You can only offer photos, and the editor curator chooses. And I think it's one tenth, one twentieth of the amount, not more, not more. Oh. oh. Well, uh, we do we do storytelling through many different ways, uh, and one is that we also collect family pictures, family photos, um, and I think uh, uh, most important is that we share 
the photos for, for telling the stories, for sharing the migrant stories of our city. So uh, for us, it's not an aim to collect and make a big, a large collection, but to connect people to each other through their personal stories. And we do this by the, by the photos. So I think uh, we collect uh, this decisive moments of life of people. Uh, and this is an example of a people who was uh, of a family who was arriving at uh, the city of Rotterdam for the first time in their life, their, mig uh, their day of migration. Uh, they arrived from Suriname, I think about 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago. Um, and for me, it was also a very beautiful picture because uh, the mass, the river is, uh, is shown. I think the connection with the world uh, is because of our river and the tides. You can feel the world coming in and coming out. Uh, and uh, it was also uh, a photo who is showing uh, the, the history of our city because there is a famous tower in it. And the tower is uh, representing the rebuilding of our city uh, after the bombardment of the city. Uh, and also I like the crooks on the photo. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it shows um, that it's used in the old glue of the family album. <laughs> we have a question for me. <laughs> I, yes, yes. Uh, um, out of how many pictures did you pick that? How many pictures do you store the pictures at all? Well, or it's just physical albums or how mm -hmm. do you store them? Yeah, we, we make them uh, digital. Uh, we have a, phot a photographer in our, um, in our team and he makes it uh, digital. And then we, yeah, many people ask us, how do you preserve your collection? But that is, um, that was not our goal. So that's, for us, it's very difficult. And I think now it's becoming more difficult because it's now containing more than 10,000 pictures or something like that. I think you started with it. <laughs> and um, so um, uh, we make the collection uh, visible by um, telling the names of the, the families and their place where they're living in the city. So, do you know personally all your donors? Do you know these people? Are yeah. they still alive, mostly. both all of them, all the four of them? Yeah, yeah, mostly they do. <laughs> but uh, we are losing many uh, persons right now, uh, last, uh, I think, two years. Yeah. But we know them a lot, yes. And uh, will they, how, how did you get this particular photo? You. You, you just uh, we pick out you, sometimes we pick do, out do you remember theme. that yes i know this this uh, this family is uh, part of a um uh, a neighborhood in rotterdam it's called the afrikaanderwijk and uh, we worked there for three years so um, we got to know a lot of people in that neighborhood especially a lot of nationalities um and it's, well, we work a lot with just ringing out on doorbells, uh, having some tea or coffee together, and then um, collect their pictures. Because I think the most people tell that they don't have a story to tell. But we think everybody has a story to tell. So That's a very nice project. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like your project very much. And I'm, I'm very happy that we, we can meet and meet, meet yeah. and talk. Our project is fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. It's not a social project. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we only try to, to save these photos and, 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 and share it. And then uh, mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, we more or less uh, fled from the Hungarian present. Uh, I have several hats. In an, when I'm bearing my other hat, I'm writing books on Budapest, and I'm a, um, an urban, I'm, I'm, I'm a, an observer of the urban scene. I've been mm -hmm. an observer for 30, 35 years now. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
with that project, with Fortopan, I am sort of fleeing the present to the past. Um, and uh, because I want to be on vacation and then with this project, and uh, I want to know everything in my, my hometown. I was born in Budapest. Mm -hmm. I have uh, I tra I traveled extensively to, to Holland many times. I've been in Holland for about 40 times in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my favorite country. But uh, I was offered jobs abroad, but I could never accept that. I mean, I'm in love with Budapest. So every mm -hmm. third photo in Fortepan is a photo of Budapest. And, uh, and uh, so I know more and more and more. And uh, I'm enjoying it very much. But we have no social agenda with that. Or if we have an indirect one, we'd like to butcher the market of the museums and archives because they charge high prices for old photos, for the youth mm -hmm. of old photos. And in these 11 years, uh, we could, we could uh, uh, take most of their markets. They, they can sell less and less old photos because who, who is so stupid? Uh, to go to museums and spend a lot of money and write long letters and ask for permission if they can find the photos in our in our archive. But just uh, tell me how this idea came to you to start this fantastic house storytelling house or house house of stories because it's physically exists exists and it's. Uh, it, 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 I, lo I love that idea to a house mm. where stories are told with the help of photographs. Yeah, well, it started with a photo exhibition. So um, I think they made a right connection between, between the two of us. Uh, we started with a, a photo, a large outdoor photo exhibition with 150 group portraits, uh, just making the people and the communities in the city visible and um, well, make it easy to have contact with each other and to know about each other, because I think that's important that people know each other and that they respect each other and that you you know, um, you get to know the, the richness of the city through the people. So that's uh, how it started. And uh, we need, we needed a, uh, an own making space for the exhibition because it was a large project. And then you think, well, it's necessary that there's a home base. So our our work is in the city, I always tell people, but our home base is open and free for people to come back to us and to make new connections and meet each other. In Hungarian, we have a saying that you sew the, the overcoat to the button. So you had first the button, your mm -hmm. idea, and then mm -hmm. you had to have a place, so this was the overcoat. So first came the button, later the overcoat. Yeah. <laughs> is it, is it yeah. correct? Can I can that's I say correct. that? Yeah, that's can correct. I, can I, can yeah. I say that? So what's yeah. what's your ambition in five years, Linda? Oh, what would my. you like to achieve? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the work is 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 for especially now in the Corona time. Uh, at first, I thought, well, maybe we cannot exist anymore because you cannot physically physically meet each other. But I think it's more and more necessary that people get to know each other. So uh, I think it's endless. But the storytelling is endless. I always tell that um, uh, when people tell one story, there comes another. So our our home uh, base, our um, uh, our home here is not not uh, not ever finished so people can contribute it all the time so it's never it's never done it's a never-ending story yes this is never ending story yeah <laughs> we have a we have a, a dream for five years we'd like to have a mobile phone application where yeah. people can go to the exact place, physical place, where an old photo was taken and yeah. they can take an, uh, a twin image from the same mm -hmm. spot and have, mm -hmm. have, have, have double photos, pairs of photos and mm -hmm. can share it with others. And we give away everything free 
So in mm -hmm. five years, if we will have this mobile phone application, mm -hmm. you can have it. We can give it to you free of charge and you can mm -hmm. use it going around in Rotterdam mm -hmm. and show school kids how it looked like a hundred years before in your street. Yeah. yeah, that's nice when you can connect generations to each other. I think. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> I think our time is up. Yeah. <laughs> it is, and it is such a nice, um, nice spot to end on, eh? this idea of intergenerational connectivity. Yeah. I love how your projects both, you said your projects are fundamentally different, but still one is in the direction of t departing from the here and now, going to photos and bringing people together that way. Mm -hmm. And the other is, I think, Linda's your project, of finding all of these photos in order to find shared stories and bring people together. So I think you have a lot in common. Yeah. Thank you for your, uh, for your talk, for your conversation. Um, nice you, Anders. Thank you. I'd love to see you personally and your house sooner yeah. or later. Very welcome. <laughs> That's an open invitation. Yeah. So great. Hey, um, we have another guest who will join us now because, uh, uh, Andras, we asked you also to um, propose a another Hungarian talent, uh, and that is Daniel Salai. He is a Hungarian artist who investigates uh, human-animal relations, and his project, uh, Novogen, was presented first at uh, Breda Photo and since then has been exhibited in multiple countries. Uh, he was honored with a Carte Blanche Award at the Paris Photo and a, a Emerging Talent Award by Lens Culture. Um, he just published a book, but Andres, tell me, what uh, did you find so inspiring about uh, Daniel's work uh, and that uh, set you to invite him? Well, I've never met Daniel uh, in person, uh, but he's one of my young stars I keep my eye on in every sector of the art. I'm a generalist, not a specialist. So in every field of art, I force myself to look on the scene and pick uh, young stars, and one of whom I try to follow later on. And uh, Daniel's work has absolutely impressed me. I think the first big project was uh, he, fo he, he took photos of uh, small objects people uh, dropped on motorways or threw out of the cars in motorway windows. It's, it was a, a large and beautiful project. And his recent project about uh, the hen that was the, 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 the the fowls that were developed the species for laboratory purposes and the way uh, how much work he put it in. So I love big photographic projects and uh, I'm very happy to, to hear him and I want to meet him in person sometime in Budapest. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, hello and welcome, uh, Daniel. Uh, I hope that's um, that's not too much praise. Are you already a bit uh, shy? Or? Yeah, um, so uh, yeah, thanks a lot. It's um, I, I feel uh, quite in, uh, nervous about all these kind words. Um, and yeah, thanks again uh, for Dash Kach for having me and also for Andras to suggest me as a as a young talent for this uh, for this talk. Uh, his wife, we haven't met each other yet. We only know each other from the culture scene, and it's a nice connection uh, that we have here today. So thanks a lot. Right, you're welcome. Well, Daniel, please tell us a bit more about your uh, about your project, um, the Novogen project. Sure. Um, so yeah, um, this call, uh, this project is called Novogen, um, as you will see in a bit, I think, uh, when we when we have the slideshow on. And uh, this is a project, uh, as you mentioned, that I did for Breda Photo, and. Um, it, produced in, it focuses on this eponymous breed of chickens, uh, Novogen, which is actually a French brand of so-called commercial layers whose eggs are used in the production of vaccines and other medications. Uh, so they use it also for laboratory purposes and, um, and other examinations. And um, I chose chicken as the main subject focus for my project because um, the one that we know today is an almost entirely man-manipulated creature that was developed over the course of the last, let's say, 60 to 70 years. And I believe that as in all designs, 
today's chickens can can tell a lot about uh, its creators, about us humans. And so, in that sense, you could almost call Novogen as a as a portrait of humanity. So the the core of the the project is formed by a workers tableau uh, comprising 168 individual portraits of Novogen white hens. Um, with which I wanted to kind of portray them as the protagonists of their industry and to pay tribute to their invisible life-saving labor. Um, this tableau is also um, important as it reflects the, the scale of mass production and brings up the question of individuality. Um, I think that the fact that at first glance we may suspect that the portraits were taken about the same hand unreals the way we think about these animals. So they are often treated and conceptualized as being mass-produced identical products, each functioning as, a, as an individual factory unit producing another product, the egg. So they are workers uh, and products themselves at the same time. And uh, they are also uh, uh, the factory workers and, the body, and their body is the factory itself. So I reflect this also by the way I photograph them. Uh, so I, I aim to lead them in the manner on the threshold of advertising, uh, back shots and portraiture. Um, and I'm also often asked why I chose this blue background. Um, firstly, of course, I did it because of its art historical references. Um, because I, as far as I'm concerned, blue is, a, is the least present color in, the, in nature in a tangible material form. And it was also the first synthetic pigment to be ever produced. And so this blue background also reminds us that the chickens pictured here are as, at least as technological as they are natural. Um, but the project also has another part to it. Um, it. It's a series of photographs that documents the eggs waste through the process of vaccine production, which I find very important because first of all, they make it clear that the eggs and so the hands laying them serving the process as no more than organic raw material, let's say, as biological carriers of our technology. Um, and I also find it fascinating that, uh, nevertheless, the fact that we, um, that, that the eggs are still being used in the production of and manufacturing of these pharmaceutical products, it really sheds light on our, uh, upon our inescapable reliance of nature, uh, even if, of course, as in this case, nature does, does, not, uh, does not refer to interwiderness. Um, and I think it's, it's, it, for, it was quite shocking to see this industrialized life of Novogen chickens, but the fact that they are treated in such a way to produce life-saving vaccines, which are for the benefit of both humans and other animals, um, actually raises a dilemma about our relationship to nature and causes us to ponder upon uh, the price we pay to maintain our health and longevity. And, uh, since its first presentation in the Netherlands, as you say, in, in Breda Photo in 2018, the project has been exhibited in many different formats. And I feel that somehow each of these uh, form, each of these presentations highlighted a different aspect of the work, uh, from the relationship to technology and nature to the issues of capitalism, uh, like the, the contemporary, uh, this continuous imperative, let's say, of productivity and consumption. Or, uh, of course, there's this uh, metaphorical reading uh, of, uh, of the project of our commodified existence. But uh, what hit me really hard lately is that at the beginning, I, I looked at these Novogen hands and their deeply controlled way of life. And I thought that, I, I assumed that they are vulnerable to us and entirely dependent on us, that they are somehow subjected to us humans. But it was a very important revelation recently that uh, the COVID pandemic revealed that we are similarly dependent on them as they are on us. And our existence is just as fragile as these chickens. Um, and we are also similar to, to our products, these chickens, in a way that we created a hygienically isolated realm for our species, let's say. And we were proven to be critically vulnerable to any intrusion uh, on its boundaries. Uh, that's why I think that the, the project became even more relevant in a way, and I wanted to make it accessible without limitation of space and time. So I was really happy to publish it with a, uh, as a book together with the Aries Kid Connection, who's also at this publishing house in, in Breda. And uh, yeah, the book has just been printed, and it's just coming out in a few weeks when the binding is finished. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so the book, um, for everybody who's um, curious to learn more, where can people order your book? 
uh, well, it's distributed through idea books, or you can also get it from the website of uh, the Aries Key Connection, the publisher. Um, but uh, yeah, it will be available throughout the world, hopefully very soon. All right, that's a good plug. Hey, and Daniel, um, just a very super pragmatic question, eh? but how do you actually take pictures of the chickens? <laughs> Well, I, I really often ask this question. Uh, of course, getting access was uh, the first great challenge, as, uh, as it's not uh, a walk-in, uh, not a drive-in uh, situation. Um, the, these hens are subject to super strict biosecurity measures, so they, they cannot be taken out of their shed. Um, and my only option thus was to, to shoot them in there. And uh, getting into the chicken coop is a complicated process, uh, even when arriving to the farm, the car gets disinfected. Then I have to take a shower, change clothes, sterilize my equipment, and then in the shed I can I can uh, put on the the, in the studio while being in disposable isolation overall and wearing surgical caps, uh, plastic gloves, and so on. Um, and so then I had to take the, the pictures in in the in this noisy flock of ten thousand hens and two thousand cocks uh, over the course of like. Five, four to five days, I think. Uh, it was quite a challenge. I also have a short footage of that. Uh, if, if, if we can ask, they, they can uh, put it on to us. So uh, I think it would be nice, nice to see, uh, maybe. Impressive and yes. uh, <laughs> impressive place to work, dear Lord. Hey, Daniel, um, what's uh, what's next for you? Where you where you, where are you taking this project after the book? Well, uh, actually, my my aim with this uh, publication of this book was to to make it accessible uh, the project uh, and also to somehow put a, a dot on the end of this sentence. I would say. Uh, I've been working on this project uh, strictly on the development for two years, and I first exhibited it three years ago. Um, and I think it's time to to look for new subjects. Uh, and and uh, of course, the chickens will fly around the world. Let's say, uh, even though they passed away uh, quite a lot of time ago in in Hungary, but I'm I'm focusing on new projects now. New horizons. Well, best of luck with that, and thank you again for joining us, Daniel. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, and that's also uh, that's also it for our edition of today, dear viewers. We uh, we thank all of our contributors again today for their conversations, and thank you for watching. You we hope you find this um, edition about Hungary uh, inspiring. I certainly learned a lot. I hope you did as well. Um, and I also have to say that this uh, was the last episode of Dutch Culture's Artists in Conversation before the summer break. Uh, we hope you enjoy the series. Have a great summer and we'll see you back in fall.